friends, Mrs. Lawson here. It's good to see you again this week. Boy, it has been really windy at my house lately. I decided to come out a bit early this morning to visit with you before it gets too blustery. So I have my morning cup of tea and my Bible, and I'm looking forward to spending some time with you. On these stormy summer days, I'm grateful that I can find shelter in my home. It reminds me of Isaiah 25, which says that the Lord is like a shelter in the storm, a shade from the heat. Did you know that the Apostle Paul would have read Isaiah 25 too? And I bet he was comforted in knowing that no matter how many hardships he faced, he had God as his refuge and strength. Hi Glenwood kids, I'm Mr. Sorensen. Last time we heard about the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey. During that trip, he wrote a letter to the church in Rome. He'd heard good things about them. He wanted to see them someday. But now, Paul was headed the other way, back to Jerusalem. He carried an offering for the poor from the believers he met on his journey. Paul's friends warned him at the dangers ahead in going into Jerusalem. They begged him not to go, but Paul knew it was the right thing to do. He would tell people the good news about Jesus, no matter what happened. When he arrived at the temple in Jerusalem, some Jews recognized Paul. They accused him of teaching against Jewish rules. An angry crowd gathered and dragged him away with shouts. Roman soldiers saw the, the commotion and went in and saved Paul from the crowd. They arrested him and took him back to the barracks. The next day, the Roman commander brought Paul to the chief priest to find out why Paul had been accused the previous day. Paul said, Friends, I have done what God wants me to do. I have done nothing wrong. He had explained that he had been arrested because he taught that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. This angered the crowd. Some agreed with Paul, some did not. The Roman soldiers had to come and carry Paul away again to safety. In the night, the Lord stood by Paul and said, Have courage. You have told them about me in Jerusalem. You must tell about me in Rome also. The next morning, a group of Jews started plotting to kill Paul. Paul's nephew heard about the evil plan. He ran to warn Paul and the commander. Immediately, the commander ordered more than 400 soldiers to march Paul away through the night to the governor's palace in the town of Caesarea. At Caesarea, Paul told the entire story to Governor Felix. The Roman leaders wanted to figure out why the Jews hated Paul so much, why they wanted to kill him. So the governor kept Paul under Roman guard, but he allowed some friends to come and visit. A few days later, Governor Felix and his wife asked Paul to come and tell about his faith in Jesus. Paul spoke about righteousness and self-control, and he explained that God was going to judge the world. Governor Felix got scared, and he sent Paul back away. Governor asked Paul to come again and speak many times, but he never did set him free, so Paul remained in prison. Two years later, a new governor named Festus replaced Governor Felix. Paul was still under Roman guard. Jewish leaders asked the new governor, Festus, to bring Paul back to Jerusalem. They still wanted to attack and kill Paul on the way. Instead, Governor Festus invited them to come to his court in Caesarea. At his court, the Jews came and argued against Paul, but they offered no proof. Then Paul had a turn to get up and speak before Governor Festus. I have not done anything wrong. If I have done something wrong that deserves punishment, then I will die. If their complaints are not true, do not hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go, Festus replied. Paul was allowed to be judged by Caesar in the highest court of Rome rather than go back to Jerusalem. King Agrippa arrived before Paul left to see Governor Festus. Governor Festus told Agrippa, all these men have accused Paul, but I cannot find anything wrong. 
Agrippa knew about the Jewish customs and asked to see Paul. So Paul again came to speak. He spoke to the king in a room filled with important people. Paul shared how he became a believer. He told them how Jesus died to save the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul, you were out of your mind, says Festus. No, said Paul. I am speaking the truth. The king knows about these matters. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know that you do. King Agrippa said, Paul, in a short time you'll persuade even me to become a Christian. Oh, how I wish you and everyone listening might believe in Jesus, Paul replied. King Agrippa got up and he told Festus that Paul might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. He could see that Paul was innocent. So Paul unexpectedly was headed to Rome. He continued to obey God and shared the gospel with everyone along the way. Next time, we will learn what happens when Paul sails to Rome to appeal to Caesar. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for, for loving us so much. Thank you for this example of Paul's courage and obedience to share the good news about forgiveness from sin. Please help us to tell people about the good news of Jesus. Amen. Boy, Paul was not frightened to stand before the powerful religious leaders, governors, and kings to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ, was he? Paul knew God is the king of all kings and the ruler of the whole universe, and he gave him the privilege to share the gospel with the world. Well, I'll see you next week for the last episode in our summer series. Oh, hi, Rue. It's great to see you again. You're here just in time. I think you're going to like this next feature. Ollie Carpentier has some wonderful furry friends just like you. Hi, my name is Holly Carpentier, and I've been going to Glenwood for about a year and a half. Um, I am an owner of dogs and a trainer of dogs. I got interested in dogs when I was really young. I went to a police dog demonstration, and I thought it was so cool that the dogs were so obedient and would run and catch people. And so I really wanted a dog like that when I got older. So then I got some dogs, some dogs I just train for fun and some for work. And this dog is Mace. He's about five years old and he's a Belgian Malinois. And I got him at about three years old. And one of the best things about Mace is how attentive he is. This is just his nature. He is super, super focused on his owner. And that's really what drew me to him. And I said, I just can't, I can't give up this dog. He was going to be a foster dog, but then I kept him because his eye contact is just amazing. And it really reminds me of in the Bible where David says, my eyes are always on you, Lord. And God asks for all of our attention. Yeah, good boy. Oh, yeah. Good, rest. Whip. And he knows a variety of commands. He can go with me. And he knows where to stay. He knows when to go front, get around. Good boy, and under. Good boy. Ah. He knows his commands in French mostly, English and French both. Couché. Stop. Good job. And his reward is a ball. And he just loves to play this game. He would play all day long. This is my little dog, Kuda. Hello. Kuda throwing. So if I was uh, gardening and dropped my glove or my hat or keys in the garden, I can send Coda to go and find it. Oh, the
Animals do things on their own all day long. They walk, they sit, they lay down. The difference with trained animals is that they're willing to do those things how and when they're directed to. The more trained an animal is, the more able and willing it is to set aside what it might naturally do in a situation and instead do what it's told to do. That's obedience. I worked every day with these dogs for years to get them focused wholeheartedly on me. No matter what's going on around them, they can do the work I set them to obediently without being distracted. Where you fix your eyes, there your heart will be. They are listening for my voice, following my leading. They don't listen to a stranger's voice. Focused healing is a way of walking that keeps the dog on the left side. The dog learns footwork similar to learning to dance so that he turns and moves at the same time the person does. Deferring means waiting while someone else takes a turn. Self-control is very important for deferring. My dogs love to play ball, so after they've worked, I reward them with chasing their favorite toys. I'm thankful for God's gift of dogs. He has used them in my life in many ways to give me joy. He has especially used them as a reminder that just as my dogs look to me for direction, I need to look to God for His direction all the time in every area of my life. Wow, that was great. I love the way animals remind us of what it means to listen, to obey, and to trust. And I'm thankful for friends who lovingly train and guide their pets. What are you thankful for today? Okay, I'm thankful for animals, tomato frogs, and Hey, I'm Eric. And I'm Becca. And, and we're, we're the, the Buckter Kirkens. And we're here to share with you three things that we're grateful for. I'm grateful for the ability to get outside and run. I'm grateful for good coffee. We're really grateful for our cats. This is Morty. And this is Stanley. Say hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. We love being able to show you what we were grateful for. Speaking of animal friends, I've been noticing a lot of squirrels lately. Have you? They're scurrying about, storing up walnuts and hazelnuts for the colder days to come. I love the way God provides for our furry friends. Say, I know, every time we see a squirrel this week, let's thank God for the many ways in which he takes care of our needs too. Friends, it has been so much fun visiting with you today. Thank you for visiting with me. I'll see you next time.